China, a land as ancient as it is inscrutable. These faces carry the zest and zeal that is the hallmark of modern China. Old as much as young, old as it is new. It reflects the challenges the Chinese people have confronted for a century and more. The transformation of an ancient civilization into a modern one. Shedding the shackles of the past to find solutions today that will imbibe the freedoms of the future in a way that is uniquely Chinese. To understand China is to first glimpse some of its history. We're at the tomb of Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi, who was responsible for the political unification of China for the first time in 221 BC. Emperor Qin was a contemporary of Chandragupta Maurya in India. A harsh but pragmatic ruler, he was responsible for introducing a common script for China, for initiating economic reforms, and for the standardization of weights and measures. Emperor Qin also initiated the construction of the Great Wall. It was near these tombs in 1974 that excavations revealed the terracotta warriors. The earliest Chinese history disappears into the shadows of folklore and legend. The Chinese have traditionally claimed a history of 5,000 years Yet the legends tell of both mortal and celestial emperors who ruled China for tens of thousands of years before this. For hundreds, if not thousands of years, a fundamental tenet of Chinese political theory was the idea that heaven gives wise and virtuous leaders a mandate to rule and removes it from those who aren't. A refinement of the mandate of heaven theory was the right of rebellion, which says that the will of heaven is expressed through the people in their continuing support of the ruler or the withdrawal of that support. This justified rebellion against tyrannical rulers and allowed successful rebel leaders to claim a mandate of heaven to rule. China, through its history, looked inward and was a land power, not a maritime nation. By the second century BC, a vocabulary had developed for dealing with foreigners. The barbarians, as they were called, were expected to come and be transformed by contact with the higher Chinese civilization. They were expected to observe the rights of Chinese courts, to offer tribute, and in return, they would be treated courteously and presented with gifts. But Chinese superiority was to mellow, if briefly, with contacts with a southern neighbor. Historians are divided about the timings of the first contact between Indian and Chinese civilizations. There are references in the Mahabharat to the Chinas or the Chinese. But there is little doubt that for 500 years from the first century AD, Buddhism, the most active religion in northern India, dominated the minds and the psyche of much of China. Buddhism traveled to China along the trade routes over the seas and came in from the northeast. We are at the Yungang Caves, about 200 kilometers north-northeast of Beijing. These caves were built 1,800 years ago over a span of 40 years. Buddhism in China spread rapidly in the north, geographically further from its source in the south from neighboring India. It was patronized by invading rulers who came in over the seas already acquainted with it. Others deliberately patronized Buddhist monks because they wanted educated officials. Monasteries and temples sprang up everywhere in great numbers. And these played a role similar to the churches and monasteries of medieval Europe. They were guest houses for travelers, hospitals, orphanages, and refuges.
the sculptors and artists of the Yungkang Caves were not imitative of Gandharvan art. Instead, they drew upon scriptural authority and looked upon their labors here as an accumulation of merit. That there was continuing interaction between India and China, the Buddhists between the two countries, is revealed by the fact that as the Hindu pantheon sought to absorb Buddhism and treated the Buddha as an incarnation of Vishnu, these caves too have statues of Vishnu in his incarnation as Kumarkadeva, with five heads and six arms riding a peacock. On the opposite wall is a statue of Shiva with three heads and eight arms riding a bull. The Chinese deified the Buddha and Buddhist philosophy and metaphysics found a Chinese expression. A number of Buddhist texts, even today, are available only in Chinese translations. The best examples of this are in the case of the writings of Nagarjuna. These translations testify to the continuous and deep contact between the Buddhist philosophical schools and the Chinese intelligentsia. No history of ancient India would be complete without reference to the exchange between Indian and Chinese arts and philosophy. But through the cycles of history, these were so completely absorbed into the Chinese psyche that these origins were rarely, if ever, acknowledged and recognized by most Chinese. There are many, um, some basic concepts of, uh, about the cosmology or about uh, life actually developed, developed from the Buddhist, Buddhist ideas. But uh, uh, in the last, uh, in the many years, Buddhism changed, uh, came to China. They have been transformed quite a lot. So now, the still we still can rec recognize some. For example, the concept of the rebirth and uh, uh, the karma. Uh, you know, most the Chinese believe is actually the Chinese ideas. The, because they learned from their ancestors, but actually they came from the Buddhism. Before the Buddhi Buddhism, there was not a very clear idea about the hell, about the heaven, about uh, what will happen after the death. Uh, it's not clear in, in Chinese uh, ideology, but this only after Buddhism came to China. But they have been transformed and absorbed into other religions, so it's hard for now for Chinese to recognize its uh, Indian origin. <laughs> It was midway into the 20th century, as the bamboo curtain parted fleetingly, that Havara and the films of Rajkapur and Indian danced touched popular Chinese culture and have remained a part of it. What are the similarities between India and China? Uh, I don't know how to say like this. <laughs> From, uh, with dance, uh, many, many movements alike. Huh? But in our um, in in our uh, the classic dance, some movements, some mudra, very much like India, huh? and we have um, some story, also very nice, uh, similar. Could you give us an example of a mudra that is mm -hmm. used in Indian dance and in Chinese dance? Yes, uh, because like this, huh? This is. Uh, moon, huh? half moon. Or in Chinese classic dance, we also do like this moon. Very similar. Mm. 
uh, they are doing me. Huh? We also do like this. Same thing. Hmm. Uh, uh, something because maybe some uh, uh, sir, how to say, worried. Huh? We Chinese also like this. Same thing for show the mood. Many many things very similar. So Chinese people understand India dance very much. And also some culture, some costume, also very uh, similar. Uh, ODC costume, very much like our very Asian classic dance. So Chinese people, um, not difficult to understand. So in our company, we are uh, performance every evening at least two India dance for Chinese people. And the Chinese people very much like this. Between the 5th and 7th century BC was a time of great awakening in Asia. In India, we had Buddha and Mahavir, in China, Confucius. As it moved towards organized agriculture, new production relations developed. There was need for a philosophical structure to sustain the new economic systems. Confucius wrote the first systemized texts of social and moral philosophy and power. These became known as the Four Books, and were to dominate Chinese philosophy and ideology to the mid-19th century when the West began knocking on its doors. Learning in China became learning these texts. Confucius shifted the emphasis of Chinese thought away from heaven and the supernatural and set it firmly down on earth, its people and the relationships between people. Confucius's impact on China has been immense. Confucius was preceded by Taoism. The Taoists rejected self-assertiveness, competition and ambition. Nature was to be made friends with rather than controlled. The idea was to blend in harmony with the Tao, which flows through everything. The Taoists rejected all formalities, show and ceremony. The Confucians sought to arrange life within the framework of a meticulous code of conduct. Confucianism stresses social responsibility, while Taoism reversed spontaneity and naturalness. It was the Confucian worldview that eventually gained the upper ground in China. In the first act of Abhigyan Shakuntalam, Kalidasa's celebrated play, there is a reference to the silk cloth of Dushyanta. It is referred to as China Chok, the Chinese cloth. Already in the Gupta times, the association of silk with China was a part of the Indian psyche. China was not a distant country then, as it later became. The Silk Route, like all other trade routes everywhere in the world, carried not only merchandise, but also ideas. From Japan in the East to the Arab world and Europe in the West, the Chinese traders and caravans traversed every corner of the then known world. If the impetus was commerce, the Chinese proverb that all men in the world bound by four seas are brothers is a testimony to the active intercourse with the outside world. It stimulated Chinese sciences and research. The Chinese were perhaps the first cartographers of the world. They also printed the first book. With the 18th century, the traffic of ideas starts flowing not from China as much as to China. China in spite of whatever one might have heard of Sinocentrism, 
has taken as much from the external world as it has given to it. Tulsi power became the major source of colonial dominance. The Silk Route was the vehicle of influences to and from China. The Forbidden City was the imperial quarters of China's last dynasty and was out of bounds for the common people. The 600 years during which the emperors ruled from here, the Chinese Empire fell from a high point of glory to a point of disgrace and disintegration. Towards the end of the 19th century, the state of the late Qing dynasty was no different from that of the late Mughals. The emperor's writ ran only so far as the gate of the forbidden city. For the rest of the country, the emperor mattered to the extent his local satraps wanted him to. We are at the forbidden city, an abiding symbol of traditional China in the heart of Beijing. It is from here that imperial power asserted itself for 600 years till the child emperor Pu Yi abdicated in February 1912. Soon after, a republican China was born under Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen died in 1925 and his successor, Chiang Kai-shek, was able to unite China for the first time under nationalist rule. He set up his capital in Nanjing. The Republican Revolution, however, did not make the situation in China any better. Yuan Shikai, who had prevented Sun Yat-sen from ruling in Beijing, tried to become an emperor himself, very much like Napoleon after the French Revolution. Yuan was ambitious but incompetent. Chiang Kai-shek unified China, but unification did not mean stability. Civil war, Japanese aggression, warlord autonomy, non-existent government, inflation, violence and death marked the next 25 years in China. In the early 20th century, China was politically fragmented. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 catalyzed groups of young men all over China to form themselves secretly into groups. In 1921, under the inspiration of Professor Li Da Chao, a professor at Beijing University, eight young men here in Shanghai on this table formed themselves together into the Communist Party of China. Present was a young librarian clerk, his name Mao Tse Tung. By 1935, Mao had emerged as the undisputed leader of the Communist Party of China. While continuing to pay lip service to Russian communism and the international community of communists, Mao evolved a brand of Marxism uniquely Chinese. Moving away from classical Marxism, which looked onto the worker as the instrument for revolution, Mao drew on the peasants instead. To Chiang Kai-shek, perhaps goes the credit of unifying China politically under the nationalist banner in 1928. But soon, there was a split with the communists. It was here in the Lishan Mountains in 1937 that the Shangxi warlord arrested Chiang Kai-shek and forced him to negotiate with the communists. This helped form a united front against the Japanese during the Second World War. But the relationship between the communists and the nationalists remained tenuous. It was in 1949 that it erupted with the formation of the People's Republic of China under the chairmanship of Mao Zedong. Chiang Kai-shek was forced to flee to Taiwan. The People's Republic of China was formally proclaimed on October 1st, 1949, two years after Indian independence. The first truly October revolution was the Chinese revolution. There is little doubt that the history of Asia changed with that event. In 1958, Mao Zedong initiated the Great Leap Forward. 
It was a strategy designed to leapfrog China from the primitive accumulation of capitalism to socialism and communism. At the core of the strategy was the creation of cellular units, urban and rural communes, with each unit generating its own capital, goods and services. The initiative was particularly true of agriculture, where per capita productivity increased, as did the per unit utilization of land. But this was to soon reach a plateau. Even then, though China had 25% less arable land than India, its agricultural production was more than twice that of India. Villages and agriculture make up China. The communes made the economies of scale feasible. Per capita productivity has been over the years pushed to its limits. In a sense, a dead end has been reached. As in other developing countries, there is a rush for urban jobs. Organizational and institutional measures for increasing agricultural productivity have been exhausted. China has now turned to technological inputs. Cooperative agriculture has been worked to its limits. Hence the new emphasis on personal initiative and technological change. Cash crops have acquired a new importance in the strategy and are probably responsible for making China a net importer of food. In olden times, I had no problem about what to plant and what to grow. Today, my family is responsible for our farm, and we decide what we should cultivate. I'm making more money today. The government has helped by increasing the supply of chemicals, fertilizers and seeds, which are available at subsidized prices. China has always wanted to be a power nobody can play with. Nuclear weapons have been political weapons for that very reason. When in the late 50s, its Soviet allies turned down the Chinese plea for an independent nuclear deterrent, the Chinese turned to a nuclear weapons program of their own with a vengeance. There was irony in the fact that the Chinese bomb went up in 1964 and Khrushchev went out of power in the same year. China's political history of the first three decades after the revolution has been marked by mass movements. But the biggest of such mass movements was the Cultural Revolution, which according to the Chinese lasted for a decade. 1966 to 1976. But by 1971, the major part of it was already consigned to history. The official view of the Cultural Revolution remains that it was a time of chaos and anarchy. But these were the years when new initiatives and foreign policy were taken. Nixon was to visit China during this very period, forging a crucial relationship between two nations so ideologically divided and hostile to each other. The nuclear program, too, seemed to have gone on undisturbed during this decade of anarchy. Nevertheless, it was a time of a mass movement of the most unprecedented kind. It appeared at times that all rationality was being abandoned. The Red Guards were parading China's streets as if they were under a spell of a kind. The Red Book, a book of the quotations of Mao Zedong, was waved as if it were a religious text. Maoist fundamentalism flourished. Most fundamentalism turns violent at some stage. So did the Maoists.
九六七年一月，面对动荡的局面，为了稳定部队，军委副主席叶剑英主持召开了军委常委会议。陈毅、徐向前、聂荣臻等老帅明确表示，军队是国家的基石，无论如何不能乱。一月二十八日，在老帅们的努力下，军签发了军委八条命令。Political opponents were treated like non-believers and persecuted. People who had given their lives to revolution were branded as capitalist roaders. Many have been posthumously rehabilitated by Deng Xiaoping. Confucius was branded a philosopher of a slave society. That was getting both philosophy and history wrong. If the flights of revolutionary imagination failed in China, so did the space flight. Nothing seemed to go right. The Cultural Revolution was chaotic, in the sense that it mistook romanticism for reality. A degree of hysteria set in. It was a small step then to failure. Zhao Enlai was perhaps the most capable, and the restraining influence on the excesses of the Maoist Revolution. Had he died after Mao, the history of China might have been different. Zhao Enlai was the most loved of the political leaders of China. Trained in Paris, he remained very Chinese to the core. There was little distance between him and his people. Mao Zedong was perhaps unlucky to have died as late as he did. He was already at the end of his influence and faculties when he passed away. He could hardly speak. His trusted interpreters used to decipher what he had to say. Nevertheless, in Mao's death, a major chapter in Chinese history ended. He was a modern-day philosopher of revolution. It is a lot of the philosophers to become redundant at some stage, and be replaced by the pragmatic doers. This was the case with Mao as well. Deng was an inevitable. If not the logical consequence of Mao Zedong, the Gang of Four stood condemned by the name their successor had given them. The fate the gang met was, of course, the same as it had imposed on its adversaries. No wonder, therefore, that the gang led by Mao Zedong's actress wife. Met the same fate. They were condemned to death, but the punishment has never been carried out. They have been denied the glory of martyrdom. Deng Xiaoping is the mystery of Chinese politics. He is also there to prove Napoleon right, that the world will indeed be different when China wakes up. Deng, with his return, has shown. The China will be different when he is back. Since his return to power in 1978, he has changed China's course as much and as firmly as the revolution in 1949 had. The 
The return of Deng Xiaoping gave a new impetus to China's politics and economy. The last Congress of the party put its seal of approval. In a sense, the course is now irreversible. The party Congress made it clear that the task of purging the party of the cultural revolution elements in it was complete. It was a Congress of Deng Xiaoping's triumph. However, it was not an unmixed triumph. There were some voices heard at the Congress which were skeptical about the affair with the market forces. Deng Xiaoping's and his policies are supreme, but that supremacy was not without questions and doubts. The Congress has for the time agreed to play Deng's game. What seems clear, however, is that the new policies have created their own institutions and vested interests. When that happens, it is difficult to reverse the course. Deng prescribed for China and the Party Congress endorsed. Like the legendary phoenix, Deng Xiaoping has risen time and again from his own ashes. There is no other leader in known communist history to have survived two disgraces and risen again, and that too to become the supreme leader. Here is a man who has just not made history, he is living history. In 1976, the year of the dragon, the most momentous events in China's recent history unfolded. In January, Chao Enlai died. In September, Mao Zedong. After a brief power struggle, Deng Xiaoping emerged the new leader of China. By 1977, after a decade of disorder and chaos, stability was restored to China. Today, Mao's embalmed body lies in state in the mausoleum on Tiananmen Square, and thousands of Chinese with a sprinkling of foreigners each day filed past his body in reverential awe, in homage to the man whose life dominated a quarter of mankind for four decades. A decade after the death of China's very apostle of revolution, the word revolutionary is just as likely to be applied to self-improvement as to social progress. Deng Xiaoping has indeed performed some astonishing surgery, burying Mao's legacy of ideological ferment, disbanding his cherished communes, running roughshod over the People's Liberation Army, and reopening China's long closed doors to the outside world. Mao left behind a conveniently blank state psychologically. By the time the tenure detour into political fantasy of the Cultural Revolution ended in 1976, the vast majority of Chinese was simply exhausted. There is poverty in China, like in any other third world country. 
the Chinese leadership is often at pains to emphasize that if China belongs to the third world, it is poised to become a major power by the next century. Their problems are similar to our own here in India. To feed a large population of over a billion people, to house them, to clothe them, to provide basic civic amenities to them constitutes the frightening challenge. But with more than one billion people spread out from some of the biggest cities on earth to the Himalayas and a painful history of frequent plunges into chaos, the essential problem of governing China is simply maintaining political control. That cuts two ways. Were it not for Mao's highly effective totalitarian machinery, Deng could hardly have moved so fast or so far. In the spring of 1978, China's leadership announced the Four Modernizations Program, an economic development strategy that would provide the country with a powerful socialist economy by the year 2000. The modernization thrust was to focus on agriculture, industry, defense, and science and technology. Communist socialist China is opening its arms in a cautious embrace of capitalist notions such as private enterprise, economic incentives, and the pursuit of profit. A classless society is coming to terms with the pursuit of privilege. For the last century, China has seen great changes in its political structures and the applications of science and technology. Some of it has not been very smooth, especially the application of the theory of collectivism and of class struggle of Marxism. But they have had a great impact on China. For a decade now, our policy of opening up to the outside world has aimed at absorbing the experience of other advanced countries, in particular advanced technical management and concepts of social life. But these will not replace everything Chinese. In fact, we seek their healthy coexistence. It isn't easy to generalize. No modernization is possible without a solid industrial base. The industrial base and the basic infrastructure were ignored in China for two decades. During the Great Leap Forward, a romantic backyard steel furnace approach to industrialization prevailed. Referring to India's steel plants, Jawaharlal Nehru called them the temples of modern India. We are at the Bonshoi steel plant, 26 kilometers away from Shanghai, where the ultra-radicals held sway during the Cultural Revolution. This is modern China's temple. Work here was started in 1978, soon after Deng Xiaoping came into power, and illustrates the impact and successes of his economic liberalizations. By 1985, the first phase was complete, and today 100% capacity utilization has been achieved. Technology was imported from Japan, and so were new ideas and modern management techniques. Since the four modernizations were launched, resentment seems to have grown towards a policy that has benefited the stronger, the skilled, and the hardworking. Higher rates of growth necessarily involve new technology, but they also involve inflation. The more wealth China has produced, the steeper has been the price rise. Today, the average urban Chinese is spending more. The range of goods that he buys is much larger. 
He was never as consumption conscious as he is today. He has clearly rejected the notion of socialism as distribution of poverty and want. According to a report in the China Daily last month, the 500 million Chinese above the age of 18 consume an average of 10 kilograms of alcohol each year. This needs 12.5 million tons of food grain to produce. The recent People's Congress took particular objection to the fall in grain production, a result of private farmers producing cash crops for personal wealth rather than the collective good. This led to the import of food grains by China. There's no slowing down the pace of reforms in China. The speed of economic growth has been very rapid, faster than our structures have been able to deal with. We are exploring measures to control further the pattern of economic reform and so regulate the overheating of the economy. We are firmly committed to deepening reform and following the new order of economic construction, promoting the system of shared profits and falling collaborations. We believe that by learning from the scientific and technological achievements of advanced countries will hasten the process of liberalization. Economic experimentation in China has also meant ideological experimentation. There is a lot happening in China today which does not fit easily into orthodox socialism. Deng Xiaoping does not call the special economic zones a retreat. He probably thinks of them as a genuine leap forward. From the ultra-radicalism of the Cultural Revolution years, this indeed is quite a leap forward. Maybe ultra-radicalism always produces its opposite. The greater the thunder of revolutionary protest the greater is the reconciliation which follows. A fiercely anti-foreign China has become a great admirer of foreign goods. A vital component of China's economic strategy is the creation of special economic zones. These are intended to encourage foreign investment in industries that are primarily export-oriented. Foreign investors are drawn to special modern infrastructural facilities, liberal taxation laws and the opportunity to repatriate their profits. In return, the Chinese earn foreign exchange, gain access to new technologies and modern management techniques. Since the opening of the economy in the late 1970s, more than 9,000 joint ventures have been concluded with foreign investors. Nineteen eighty five imports rose by eighty eight percent, exports by one point five percent. The trade deficit has widened to fourteen billion US dollars. Some international economists have argued that the open-door policy to foreign capital and intellectual technology is an indication of China's reintegration into the structure of global capitalism. The existing policy of linking wages to performance will create different levels of income and achievement between skilled and unskilled workers, which could lead to social tensions.
A visitor to China is struck by the range and growth of small enterprise. Today's China recognizes that it was perhaps a distortion to insist that all productive and service activity, no matter what its nature and scale might be, has to be state controlled. I opened this shop after borrowing money from friends. I'm working much harder and longer hours than in my earlier job in the factory. But in one year, I have paid back my friends. Sometimes I feel uncertain, but I am much happier. Though I got no help from the government, they did not stop me. Oh, darn it. All these changes in fashion and clothes are very superficial. China is a great agricultural country with over 800 million people living in rural areas. To emphasize westernization will be an oversimplification. In the last decade, we have seized the chaos and the instability of the Cultural Revolution, and those like myself who were persecuted have been rehabilitated. In the process of democratization, there will be seeming contradictions and the possibility of social chaos, but we can control the process. We are doing this by realizing the separation of the party and the government, enhancing the active participation of the people. If music corrupts, Western popular music corrupts absolutely. Or so the cultural commissar implied in his 1982 book, how to recognize pornographic music, in which he warned that Western music provokes the nerves. It is a tribute to the inherent reforms that this has not inhibited the taste of young Chinese. Traditional Chinese clothes are impractical in modern China. Young people today are exposed to Western concepts, so it is only natural that they should want to wear Western clothes. Everyone wants to look beautiful and attractive, so our ideas of personal beauty are also changing. So makeup, perfumes, and hairstyles are inspired by West. While it is true that Western fashions are making an impact in China today, we must recognize that it is an inevitable process. Even the Mao suit worn so widely not long ago by both men and women was imported into China by Sun Yat-chen from Japan. It is my effort in my designs to keep intact essential Chinese designs. Our Chinese fashions are very popular in the West these days because they have a mystery about them. We export a lot of designs which are then 
sold to famous fashion houses abroad. China is slowly emerging from decades of rigid censorship and control of writing, creativity and intellectual property when the works of William Shakespeare and the music of Beethoven were banned because the character of the bourgeoisie that enjoyed them transferred to these works. Today there is a growing liberalism, if still cautious and tentative. The works of Western classics are being translated into Chinese as is Valmiki's Ramayan. Here at this store, the hardest selling item is the Chinese English dictionary. China has a near 100% literacy. East Asians are great readers and public reading is common. Bookshops are frequently like department stores, multi-storied. Books are inexpensive and well produced. There is inevitably still a premium on constructive criticism and the social relevance of literature. Censorship has eased. The now defunct democracy wall made so much news largely because of the Chinese habit of public reading. The Marxist dictum of Mao's China with each individual according to his capacity, to his needs. In the post-revolutionary China of Deng Xiaoping, there is a growing emphasis on the each according to his capacity. The pursuit of individual excellence is no longer disparaged as the pursuit of elitism. We are here at the Children's Palace in Shanghai, where 1,500 children between the ages of 6 and 16, with unique talents, are selected through a rigorous examination procedure for special nurturing. They are trained in areas as diverse as traditional Chinese music, the piano, calligraphy and computers. Here indeed are the building blocks of China's future. Creative and artistic freedoms have been revived in China. They were once the stinking ninth category of enemies in China's cultural revolution. A class more despicable than landlords and even spies. Yet now for a second time in 30 years, a bouquet of friendship is being handed out to Chinese artists and intellectuals. Today, writers, artists and performers pursue their crafts with less interference than ever, 
stretching the limits of Maoist doctrine, that art must serve politics. There is no longer the emphasis on socialist realism. While it is still possible to go too far, the loosened cultural fetters today present the peculiar challenge of separating creative efforts from the strictly political constraints of the past without upsetting party ideologues. Twenty years ago, even the art of calligraphy was attacked. It is not only characters, but a form of self-expression. It is said of calligraphy that by looking at it, one understands the writer fully as of meeting him face to face. After only a few years of experimentation, it became obvious to party leaders that the pace of economic reform was being severely impeded and that a process of democratization would need to be set up. With the emphasis on economic life, the authority of the party seems to be weakening and the government has been at pains to emphasize that democracy is really the indispensable political condition for the realization of the four modernizations. But democracy in China is more a means to natural wealth and power than a method of public control of government. China's democratic debate has been shaped by its historical and philosophical evolution, where participation has always been a crucial concept, even if a participation without influence. We are gradually, I mean, uh, moving to the uh, more democratic. We will have some uh, local government, I mean, in lowest level, I mean village. We will have uh, a conference of uh, uh, every uh, rural family, every, uh, say we have just something like panchayat. Uh, in India, you have panchayat. We will have something like panchayat. Uh, but we will do it more seriously. We will let everybody in, I mean, others, uh, they can uh, do their, uh, everybody can exercise their uh, power, I mean. How effective and efficient do you think uh, the induction of Western capitalism can be in China? given that it is, it, is, it is a strategy born and bred in, in the context of Western liberal democracy, uh, which isn't uh, the, the form of democracy that, that is practiced in contemporary China. Uh, I think it's a, a, uh, it's a question of time, gradually, from lowest level to, I mean, to district. Maybe we will have something like uh, your uh, general elections. But not now. Uh, but I'm not an expert on political system. But in my own opinion, I think a uh, democratic uh, process in China will be greatly improved. To what extent, uh, I have no idea. But I hope, for myself, I hope this process will be faster. Because I'm now in my old age, yeah, I will, uh, I mean, uh, see that change, yeah, say, within 10 years or so. So I am for the democracy uh, and uh, the socialist system. A decade of economic reforms has unleashed forces that push the Chinese to scramble for a slice of the much enlarged economic cake. The state preaches the virtues of thrift but there are no longer any strong moral and ideological forces to restrain the craze to buy, spend and consume. To many Chinese, the socialist spiritual civilization actively promoted by Beijing in the last few years only means no shouting and no spitting. Here, a fine is being imposed of one yuan, or about four rupees, for spitting on the streets.
As China reaches out to external ideas and influences while resurrecting some of its own, it confronts the challenges and problems of development similar to what we do in India. There is now smog in Canton and prostitution in Chinese ports and corruption has raised its ugly head. The Chinese government in Shanghai alone has set up 24 reception centers such as this one where citizens can file complaints against government officials for corruption. Since June this year, 6,000 cases have been filed, 250 ferreted out for investigation, there have been 40 cases initiated, and 60 people have confessed to their crimes. In the words of Deng Xiaoping, when you open the wound window for fresh air, you are bound to let in some insects. It is true that many negative elements of Western developed economies are appearing in China in a small way such as some cases of corruption. But we believe these are minor imperfections that can be resolved if we continue to build on the firm basis of equitable social relations. In the China of the future, in the China of, say, uh, of, of the year 2000, what is his model uh, in terms of uh, political structures uh, and the economic uh, structures and, and, and their coexistence? China is deeply committed to a socialist society, and we are in the process of redesigning and interpreting Marxism in a way that is relevant to modern China and can help the speedy development of the country. We will, of course, preserve our unique Chinese characteristics in art, literature, family and personal relationships. We will encourage multiplicity of ideas. This is a mosque in Xi'an, a city in northwestern China a mosque built in a typically Chinese architectural style. Chinese society is not the monolith it seems. It is a mosaic of many colors. Modern China derives a part of its strength from the mosaic quality of its society. Chinese language and art traditions have cemented various segments of that society together. We did suffer during the Cultural Revolution, but over the last 10 years, there has been a resurgence in active organized religion in China. While it is true that most of the members of our mosque are elderly, there are no restrictions on becoming a Muslim, and we have a number of young people. With the growing bad influence of Western ideas and the growing freedom, I'm sure more people will become Muslims. As traditional wisdom has it, politics is the art of the possible. In Deng Xiaoping's China, politics has become the art of, by and for the pragmatic. Extensive contacts and cooperation among nations and increased interchanges and understanding between peoples will make the world we live in more safe, more stable, and more peaceful. China has dramatically thrown open its windows to the world. Its changed approach stems as much from a conciliatory impulse as from pragmatism. It needs to widen its trade links and modernize its economy. Goals which require greater flexibility in its foreign policy and the easing of tensions with its neighbors. Bertrand Russell had said that China confronts two kinds of foreign powers, the white nations and Japan. In the 30s, the Japanese proved Russell more than right. A large-scale invasion of China began in 1930-31. China knew little more than destruction and suffering for the next two decades. It took another three decades after that to change that confrontation into collaboration. 
healing the wounds was commerce. Ideological differences and border disputes had long divided the two most powerful communist nations. The mood of collaboration and cooperation is so strong in China that an erstwhile and most hated Soviet Union is not out of bounds today. Мы удовлетворены в целом развитием сотрудничества в различных сферах жизни, подчеркнул Михаил Сергеевич Горбачев. Но считаем, что здесь положено... As both countries initiate their own processes of liberalization, the Chinese foreign minister was in Moscow recently. A Sino-Soviet summit in the first half of 1989 is on the cards. Relations with the United States began to change way back in 1971-72, when Kissinger and Nixon visited China and met with Mao Zedong. Following the Nixon-Mao meetings, there was a second fill-up to Sino-American relations with Deng Xiaoping's visit to the United States. American businesses which had anticipated access to huge profits from large Chinese markets were to be soon disappointed. The Chinese climbed down from the USSR as prime enemy perception they once shared with the US to better relations with both superpowers. Some months ago, in a fitting reversal of dependency, the Chinese government signed contracts with American agencies to launch U.S. satellites on Chinese rockets. We expect that normalization will help to move us together toward a world of diversity and of peace. For too long, our two peoples were cut off from one another. Now we share the prospect of a fresh flow of commerce, ideas, and people, which will benefit both our countries. The haunting melody of Raj Kapoor's Avada is still heard and remembered in China. Indian films dubbed in Chinese are not rare. Our cinema, with its emphasis on the narrative, gets across easily to Chinese audiences. Rarely in human history have two people so comparable in terms of civilization and of modernity have sought a dialogue, a working, amicable relationship with each other. There could be a future awaiting us. The challenge is one of grabbing it and giving it shape with mutuality. Uh, we believe there, there have been some change in the whole global situation. There have been a relaxation between the relations uh, uh, between the United States and Soviet Union. There emerged a trend of a dialogue replacing uh, confrontation. And this trend is felt in all parts of the world. And it, uh, of course, it has its impact on the Sino-Indian relations. It is China's hope that the two countries will improve their relations on the basis of five principle of peaceful coexistence. Very soon, the Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, will visit China. This is the first visit by the Indian Prime Minister uh, in the 30th 
four years. Therefore, it is a great event in the relations between the two countries. We are now making earnest and positive preparation for the visit, and we believe this visit will be a complete success. Of course, between China and India, there is the boundary question. And we, it is our belief that the uh, boundary between China and India has never been formally delimited. The Chinese government hope an early settlement for this uh, problem, and we believe, uh, guided by the principle of mutual understanding and mutual accommodation, and through the friendly consultation, it is not difficult to settle the problem between us. The Indian position has been that while it may not be possible to resolve the border issue, uh, we need to keep making progress on other bilateral matters. Would the minister comment on what these other bilateral issues might be? Uh, we also agree with this position. We think China and India can uh, increase their contact in the fields of uh, economy, trade, technology, cultural exchanges, sports, and exchange of personnel, and some other fields. And both China and India are countries with large populations and with ancient civilizations, and we are both on the Asian continent and we are neighbors. Therefore, we can do a lot together. Tiananmen Square in the heart of Beijing, the Vijay Chok and Rajput of China, which can accommodate over a million people on national ceremonials. Behind me, the Gate of Heavenly Peace, which, while still anchored with the portrait of Mao Zedong, symbolizes China's new openness to the world. Since the revolution of 1949, the Chinese people have been witness to the blooming flowers, the great leap forward, the cultural revolution, the Gang of Four, the four modernizations, periods of sudden and bewildering change. But today there is the promise of continuity and stability as China reaches out to the outside world for political and economic influence. It is a China we cannot ignore.